Right, guys, welcome to the Resilient Businessmen podcast episode number five. Today, I'm joined by guest Lee Flanagan, who's going to openly share his experience through addiction and how he's went from arguably rock bottom to creating business success. So I think it's going to be hugely beneficial for anybody tuning in. So Lee, if you want to just give a little brief introduction to who you are, what you're about, etc. Super. Thanks for having me on, Chris. I appreciate it. Um, Obviously, Lee Flanagan, I'm based in Teesside. I'm a borough lad, which I'm very proud of, of course. I think your partner's a borough lad, isn't she? Yeah, she is, yeah. There we go. Whereabouts? She's from Thornaby. Up the borough. So, um, <laughs> I'm from Middlesbrough. I played football as a, as a kid, went into my teenage years, went to Hull City. I'm a father of two beautiful children, Honey and Kit. And I'm the lead bespoker, which means I'm the leader of a, a company called Bespoke Financial Group. Um, we've got 100 and between 100 and 150 people in our system. We're actually out live now offering advice with number one protection firm in the UK. I'm passionate about um, leadership. I'm passionate about sales. I'm very big upon self-development. Um, and I'm obviously on my own journey because I'm, I'm an addict and I'm trying my best to get better for, for myself, my children, my family, my friends, so I can have a better life moving forward. So, Awesome. So as with most resilient journeys in life, there's a starting point, and I think hopefully we're going to start from childhood. No, uh, and then <laughs> let's just start the journey from there and see how we go. <laughs> uh, if you want, we can just skip that part, you know, and just. Go <laughs> um, yeah. So as a child, mate, I, I grew up on the Whitney Banks estate, Middlesbrough, which I'm, you know, Whitney Banks is my heart, very very close to my heart forever. Um, all my family are from there. And, you know, growing up in an estate in, in Middlesbrough in the 80s and in the 90s was rough. It was tough, simple as that, you know. So, but I wouldn't change a thing. We had a fantastic childhood. Grew up with my cousins, grew up with my mates. They were still my mates now. Um, there was elements of childhood that I absolutely loved and elements that I've decompartmentalised, locked away through the key as far away as I could. But obviously, you know, going through the... The journey of trying to get sober and clean, I'm having to go and find that key and open them up again, and that's quite painful. Mm. What were the some of the best memories you had as a child? Playing with my mates, playing with my cousins. Um, loved certain elements of school I really loved, certain elements bored me rigid. I remember always being, get caught out, get called. Remember the saying, he's got Symbitis dance. As you get told that you've got Symbitis dance, I was always on the move and my daughter, Honey, who's, who's my princess, she's, um, she's autistic and um, she's got ADHD and, and, and without a shadow of a doubt, and the Spurges, and without a doubt, I've, um, I've got something as well. Sorry, she hasn't got ADHD. I was told by a psychiatrist, Sarah, a good friend of mine, I've got adult ADHD. But at the time, I mean, I'm older than you, of course, there was nothing like that about, you know, so it was just a case of he was, he was a naughty kid. So certain elements, I just I love playing with my mates, being out, playing, playing with my uh, my cousins, my pals. Football I enjoyed to a certain degree. And then the score and who was top scorer and winning and losing become a lot more than a game at some point. And, you know, in hindsight, looking back, I think it was quite pressurised. Um, I'm not sure I had the intrinsic internal switchboard to sort of deal with pressure at that at that stage of my life. E even now with certain things I, I, I can say that I can struggle with when it comes to pressurised situations, you know. Mm, I can relate to that as well. So did you do well in school? Not as well as I should have done. Um, you know, if you if you certain people I work with will tell you like math, for example, I've probably got an A or an F. So not good at all, but you know, I, I'm I'm good at math. So I, I should have been an A student, um, but the subject matter just, just bored me. Like, I had no interest in it apart from it. history. I loved history. I still mm. love history. I think you want to know the future, the answer to your futures, unless major changes made. Look at your history. And um, you, you think about how we consume information, how we consume diet, technology. Probably not as advanced as what it could be or should be. Um, but we're still human beings, right? You know, human nature doesn't change so much. You know, we, we still have all the same characteristics we did many moons ago. Yeah, I agree. So the transition from school to teenage years, before we press record on our podcast, mm -hmm. you, you mentioned you 
played like football to a high standard. So talk me through that transition, how you got playing, etc. Yeah, I did. I mean, as a kid, I, I love football. I had a really bad injury. I got run over, broke my leg. I was I was I played in Middlesbrough. I, I'd gone away to like Newcastle and wow. uh, Jeff Wade Villa and whatever else, and broke what my leg really bad. Sorry. Wait, what position? Centre forward. Oh, he's a striker. There we go. Yeah, well, like my say, my family, we we got like a real fast gene. Um, we're all really quick. My yeah. cousin, he killed, he runs obviously in the Olympic squad. He's a sprinter for a, he's he was Olympic captain this year. So we're all we all got fat asses, big thighs, and run quite fast. Um, <laughs> so I was prepared for a front, but coming back from an injury, that was a battle in itself to sort of get to a level again, start playing. But I think in my uh, around 13, 14, I just lost all interest in football. I'm not sure where I ever really regained it, even mm-hmm. to the point when I when I retired when I was 27, 28 year old. I'm not sure I ever regained that real love and desire of football truth been on. I'm not sure I ever did. Um, I mean, I don't even watch it on the telly. I'll watch a Champions League final, the odd England game, Borough game, because I love Borough, my own tip, my son. But I'm not I'm not a big football fan, truth be known, man, if I was to be really honest. Do you remember what the, the difference was at 13 to 14? Were you just driven into it too much or just, I don't know? Too driven into it too much. Um, confidence was, was an issue. You know, confidence was a major issue for me, I think. Historically, when I look through the past my life, whichever environment I go into, it takes me a while to adapt, and then I'll grow it in myself and become a louse in the room. <laughs> Social media will probably tell you that. Um, but yeah, probably confidence, and, and I got a girlfriend. You know, you same old story. We young lads all last to play football. You, you turn into a young adult, and you know, another thing starts to interest you. Yeah, I remember. I had trials at Darlington once and I turned it down because I was going up with some lass at the time. <laughs> and I didn't want to stop seeing her on a weekend. And uh, yeah. it blows your mind when you get older, like, why did I make that decision on it? So, yeah, things you do as you're younger. But you know what? You've been true to yourself at the time. If you didn't desperately want to go on the trial, you didn't desperately want to be a footballer. And that, that is what it is, right? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, but um, sports, like, so essential, isn't it, for our belief, for like young lads? It's just a big release, isn't it? Like, escapism rather than causing trouble on the streets. I, I firmly believe I would have been in a lot of trouble if it wasn't for sport. Can you relate to that at all? Or? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I got into a lot of trouble. I always have been in a lot of trouble. I'm quite, um, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm a bag of energy. But I, um, sport's so important for young children and, and for adults. Yeah, it's just yeah. an important part to be part of so much we can say. It's a great point of reference for business. Um, help be part of a team. Goal-oriented, face setbacks competition, preparation, um, evolving, adapting, looking for new ideas, welcoming new people to your group, people leaving your group. It's a, it's a wonderful point of reference for, for business and for life sport, you know. For boxing, for example, it's sometimes you're not being allowed to it away, you get your own way, sometimes you get robbed of a decision, sometimes you're rocked and you just need to hold on and see the round out, sometimes you get beat, sometimes you win. It's just like, it's a great reference for life, mate. And so, yeah. Massive, 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 massive advocate of, of sports for anybody, um, especially children, because I think the best time to break somebody is when they're, when they're younger and a little bit weaker. Yeah, absolutely. So talk to me, what happened next? So what's a key a key turning point for you? Because so I went to Hull City, um, did an apprentice. Looking back, best days of my life. Not sure I, I sort of appreciated that time. Because I used to get a train home every weekend to, to go out. Listen, you know what? Actually, I'm just saying to you, it was a light bulb moment. I used to get a train home every weekend um, from Hull, two hours, which seemed like a million miles away because we didn't have social media then. We didn't have <laughs> iPhones. Then. It was just a case of we had one house phone. You had to ring your, your family on the house phone and, or I'd be ringing my girlfriend, wherever it may be, my pals. Um, so a very, very different world, you know. And um, I used to get the train home and go out every weekend for my mates. I was the last one saying, or in a big group, everyone from, from school, you know. Um, but, but great memories, learned some wonderful lessons, made some fantastic friends, who sadly are probably not in touch with, touch with as much as I'd like to. I'll comment on a message on Facebook. Um, come home from there, started playing non league football, Northern League, and, and it's a big, you know, it's a big culture shock for anyone who plays football, semi pro, so a professional, and comes out and play, starts playing semi pro. It's quite a Quite the culture shock. You've got to adapt pretty quickly. Um, and, and in some ways, football prepared me really well for certain elements of life. But I was very underprepared in a lot of ways as well. I, I was left clueless. I didn't know what career to take. I didn't know where to go. I really struggled to let go of the football dream. 
Right. Um, yeah, I, I did. And you see a lot of lads doing that, right? Yeah. Let go. Maybe this year I'll get picked up and maybe I'll be the next day and write or Jamie Vardy. And, you know, God's got a plan, a better plan than what we've always got. But mm. I started playing football. I had a little, they got me a job. I was working in Magnet Warehouse, the kitchen warehouse in Darlington, which I was very grateful for a job, but that job was not suitable for me. And I hated it. But I, I earned money. And before I knew it, I was 28 years old. By the time I was 28, I had a mortgage and a beautiful little girl called Honey. And, um, but I'd also developed a rage and drug addiction. And I was a bit of a joy running about here and there for drugs and whatever else. And real, I would say I had a dual life, but it was more like a, you know, <laughs> a quadrant. I have four different lives and personalities, different friendship groups, work, family, drug addiction, whatever it may be. I had four, like loads of different groups I'd go to and my life's slowly but but definitely crumbled apart, apart around me. I was left homeless, toothless. Really relevant that, because it was the drugs that sort of made me toothless. My appearance, I was probably not eight, nine stone, ringing wet. Wow. Um, and, and yeah, my, my life just spiraled out of control, mate. We lost our home in the recessions. So I ended up with a, a negative equity to Northern Rock of 70, 80, 90 grand. Wow. Um, when you're when you're a drug addict, you end up on not very nice people, money, and you become a master of sort of like Robin Peter pay Paul to feed your addiction. Um, but being said, I, I wouldn't, you know, I, I I'm the best salesman in the, in the country, without a shadow of a doubt. And I, and if I sound arrogant in saying that, I apologise. You know, I'm saying it from the most humble heart in the world. I'm telling you, I was nan so ring about with no teeth and a drug addict, so I'm not coming from a place of being arrogant. But I'm the best salesman and sales leader in the UK by a million mile um, across all sectors. But I think the drug addiction helped me become a really good leader. And it definitely helped me become a good salesperson. Without going through that challenge, I would not have been prepared to, to, be, to, to become where I'm going, who I am, what I am within this industry now, you know, because everything you're going through is just God's way of preparing you for what's coming next. And drug addiction definitely without any shadow of a doubt, helped me become a better salesperson and leader, as weird as that sounds, but it did. So can you give me some context why that is the case? <laughs> oh, sure. That's no worries. Well, drug addiction, when you're homeless, when you've got no teeth, when you're, when, you're, when you're an addict, when you've overdosed on multiple occasions, right, and people know and aware of that, what it does is it gives you an air of humility. Okay, so it also, humility helps create empathy because you've become less judgmental. You're coming from a place, well, I'm here, so I might judge anybody else. It also gives you a place of real fire in your belly because what it is, it's fear just turned upside down fire and sort of just like, it, it gives you that fire thing. But I'm not scared of going back there with a needle in my arm and overdosing and letting all them people down again um, that I'm going to work relentlessly. Addicts don't sleep. Addicts don't sleep. They're just 24 seven fiends. And I was the worst. I, well, I am the worst. As if I'm sort of in recovery. Uh, you know, so if it's, sorry, I said that as if I was like, Elton John, 20 years recovered. I'm not. So I, I am the worst addict. And I've been, I've, you know, the, the sleepless nights, the constant obsession, obsessive, relentless need to go and get that, that again. I've carried that into business. Mm. I will work, I'll work every single person. My work ethic is my biggest asset, without a doubt. I can go 16, 80 hours a day, seven days a week, no problem whatsoever. Every single week, I've done that for 12 years. Um, and, and, you know, when, when, you, when you're an addict, being a salesperson, what you do is you learn to, to sort of read people quickly. You sort of you become very creative. Um, you become very um, resourceful, and you make do. So there's a lot of people who come out of addiction um, with the right training, with the right values, and with the right intent, could make a wonderful career in, in, in something if their illness would allow it. Well, I think that makes sense. Yes, yeah, incredibly fascinating here, to be honest as well. Can you, I don't know if you're open for this, could you like give me an example of what a typical day in the life was when you were in that drug addiction, like from the, the moment you wake up in the morning throughout the day? Yeah, well, sometimes you don't wake up, right? Because you just, you, you still look. Right. So, de depending on, on what era, my addiction went in different eras. But the early days, the dark days, would be, uh, I'd, I'd be up, 
if I was living alone, I'd be up all night by myself, or I'd have people in the kitchen, or I'd be in someone's kitchen. Everyone's your bro, and everyone's your mate. They're not. You're just all a bunch of lost people who are using, and they're sort of just taking gear from each other and, and, and spending time with each other. And you should be home with your family. And I'd, um, I'd spend time these false friendships and these false conversations and drug bullshit talk. Everyone's your best mate and we'll do this and we'll do that and we'll go, just bullshit. Mm. Yeah, we've all... Um, and I'd get up if I was at work. I'd, I'd just sometimes get clothes on and, and go to work at six in the morning. Sometimes I'd still be high. Sometimes I'd still be rattling around and I'd go to work and and you just make it through the day. You finish work and, and, and you're off on another adventure. Go and get high and see, you know, just find that next hit, find that next hit, find that next hit. It's very, very dark at times, mate, yeah. Avoiding people. Avoiding people at home. Sometimes when you're high and you're in the house, you, you, you're, in, you're in your house or you're in, your, you're in an apartment, but really you, you're locked away in your own head. There's people outside. Someone's coming to get me. Mm-hmm. Um, how do we get more? How do you get more without paying for it? Um, how can we get more without them knowing that we got that? And, and it's just constant, like, darkness. The devil, the devil at work. Mm. So how did you get out of it? Well, well, I'm not out of it, mate. No, I um, I drank, never used. Um, two weeks ago in Barcelona. I always visualise, even throughout the moments, what's really important is, I always I, I had real faith and, and I've got it ineptability to manifest things in reality. Um, I, I'm a huge manifester um, and really good at it as well, both negative and positive, actually. But always then, I, I always visualised greatness. I always thought about being the best. As a kid, I always used to think Bernie Slaven, number seven shirt, running off, scoring a goal. That sort of transferred into selling. And I would go out of it as I got offered a job selling, selling insurance for a company called Combine Insurance, Company of America. What I did, Chris, I went on a training course, which, was, which wasn't pleasant for me because I was the most lost little boy in the world. Raging drug addiction at the time. Um, How old were you at the time? How old were you at the time? 29. I just met a girl. Um, and you just try to kid the world, don't you? You're not an addict. You're living in your own web of lies. And um, you had to let a lot of people down by then. Um, so you're carrying a lot of guilt and a lot of shame. But I had a desire to try and get better. I had a desire to try and make better of myself. I went on the training course. I had my suicide notes written out. I knew exactly what train I was going to jump in front of. I knew exactly what um, what time it come, where it was at Yam train station. And I was just going to do a header. Wow. So I went there with nothing to lose, really. The girl I was seeing got me a suit that was too big for me. Like, really big. Like, really big. Like a Roy Hodgson style suit. You know, just pop <laughs> and um, I had one shirt for the week. I washed that in the bathroom every night, old school with the bar, another hotel bar. So I must have went through 20 of them for the week. So I was just washing that. I had no food, for, I had no food, money, because you had to pay for your own uh, dinner and tea. And they just used to give you breakfast in the morning every morning. Wow. So I had five meals for the week. Uh, but that was not that was nothing out of the norm for me, being a raging, raging addict. You had good days without food at times. And um, I fumbled my way through the week. I somehow made it. I remember I got a book, W. Clement Stone. The Success System That Never Fails, one of my favourite books of all time now, now that I actually read and, and well, listen, I um, it's one of my favourite books ever and he's the greatest insurance man of all time, as W. Clement Stone. And I was given a book, I remember at the time they said that Craig Birch, who I recently reconnected with on, on Facebook, I was sitting there and um, they said, the, the star of the week, we never give these books away, it's very, very rare we'll pick someone out who we think's just got the magic and they'll go far in the in the industry, but there's someone that's course this week and Craig openly said, I know this person will go to the to the heights till, till we'll reach the absolute top. Um, like Mount Rushmore type of thing. And I was like, all right, I didn't know what Mount Rushmore was. Um, I thought it was somewhere in York, you know, so I'm just sick because that's where the training course was. So I'm sitting there and they said, oh, it's Lee, Lee Flanagan. And I sat clapping for ages. <laughs> clapping for so long, right, Chris? And I was like, just clapping away. And I go, Lee, it's you. And I was like, Mate, wow. and I couldn't get my own head around it. I was like, mate, I didn't even think I passed the course, but no, you're gonna go fire you. So I was like, oh, really? And it sort of triggered something off inside of me, but not enough because I remember I went through about two or three years around that period of time where getting a shave, which I have to do quite a lot, obviously being bald and brushing your teeth and whatever. I never used to I used to do it in the bath quite a lot. And I remember I got questioned, and we sort of worked out years later through my counselor, who's one of my best friends, that 
I used to do that because I couldn't bear looking in the mirror. So I went through a period of two, three years of not looking in the mirror. My clothes at the time were probably, <laughs> you're probably able to tell by looking at some of the gear I used to wear, but um, it was it was a dark time, but it was the start of a, a wonderful journey. And I, I absolutely loved every single minute of this insurance journey. And, yeah, I'm buzzing the, the friends, the friendships I've made of Bishop and the memories I've made have been better than anything I could have done in football, I feel. Well, what a journey, ups and downs. But um, yeah. can you remember what was, what was the standout for you? Like when he picked you out, why did he, like, what, what was the thing about you? Can, can you um, I mean, I don't know. I mean, on the journey, it's not finished yet. We've got a long way to go. Yeah, we've got some massive affirmations to come here and they'll all come true, God willing. Why did he pick me for that week? You'd have to ask Craig. Yeah. Um, the last day, my, my shirt was soaking wet because I'd washed in the bathroom and it didn't dry in time. Um, I, I was speaking to my friend Chris Rooney. We're filming a documentary. With, do you know Wonder Films in Middlesbrough? I don't, mate, no. Uh, the big company in Middlesbrough. Do, the, we do, we're doing a documentary on this journey at the moment. And one of my good friends, Chris Rooney, who's, who's my football manager at Billings St. Donia, Chris says that, this is Chris's words, not mine. He thinks that I've been given the gift of from God of resilience. So maybe he's... Maybe he's Craig maybe seen a bit of that in me. I, I don't know, you'd have to ask him. Yeah, it sounds like you're oozing with resilience um, in your journey. So talk me about seals. You said you're the best salesman and you've got loads of passion behind it. So I'm fascinated by seals as well. So give me some insight. I am the best salesman. I am the best salesman in the UK, best sales trainer. Um, and I say them things because I think you've got to believe them things for it to come true. Big part of sales mindset and activity. It's one of my sales beliefs. Um, I've got I could go on with all day about sales beliefs. Swag, you've got to have a real element of swag. Swag's being able to go from one failure to the next with the same level of enthusiasm. Swag, self-belief, self-confidence. If that's only there, you'll only perform there. Your swag's got to be through the roof because as a salesperson, you're going to face an ocean of rejection. And the ones who can just bat that out of the way and just adapt, process information, adapt and find a positive solution will win. So you've got to have a major element of swag. You've got to lot, have a lot of heart because you are tough being a salesperson. There's a reason it's the highest paid job in the world. You've got to have a big heart because really you're intent to help people. That's all selling is, helping people make better choices. You've got to have a sickening and fucking relentless work ethic when it comes to sales. You've got to, um, you've got to master the art of the introduction. So you've got to look the part, you've got to feel the part, you know, your mindset. Um, how you feel about yourself is so, so important when it comes to sales. And I could go on and on and on, but selling is just helping people make better decisions. Selling is the, the absolute fuel to the economy's um, journey. There's no two ways about it. And some people can sell people, some people can't. I know you've been in the property course today. My, um, my One of my business partners, Terry Blackburn, he, he's up in Newcastle. It'll be good for you to chat with. Terry won Property Investor of the Year 2021. No, them, them courses drive Terry Potty he said they're all full of shit. When it comes to sales training, fuck me. Some of them couldn't sell a black cat to a witch. So the fact that they're out there selling boggles my mind. Like car sales lads. I've got some really good car sales lads. But I mean, how hard is it to sell a car? You're sitting there, someone walks into your place and yeah. says, can I sign a direct debit form? We sell something in insurance, which is not tangible. You can't touch it, drive it, smell it, taste it, feel it. You're selling the direct debit. And nobody likes direct debit. So you've got to have a really high skill set. And on a lot of fucking resilience and, and I think, sorry, mate. On the phone as well, is it? What, you do a lot on the phone, yeah. COVID's changed everything over the phone, but everything starts over the phone. There's five yeah. main things to be a really good salesperson within our industry. You've got to be brilliant on the phones. You've got to be able to close the deal within 20 minutes because speed kills. Amazon and Netflix took away waiting for a product. You know, we were the most fast-paced, demanding consumer of all time in human, human history now because Amazon and Netflix took away the waiting time to go and get a product. It's just their instant now straight away, right? Yeah. Um, you've got to be able to generate referrals. You've set up referrals of the journey next week's, at the fuel for next week's journey. You've got to be able to mark yourself on social media now. You've got to be able to put yourself out there and have a personal brand. And you've got to be able to recruit. If you're not recruiting in sales, you're dying without a shadow of a doubt. And recruitment could be introducers, new clients. It could be building your team. It could be building new opportunities. But you've got to be able to do them five things relentlessly over and over again. That becomes a circle of success. But sales is just helping people make better choices. Mate, I could go on and on all day. We were sales, mate. It's worth another call, maybe. But this, some people can sell. And those who can't haven't been trained properly. It's a skill. It's not a fucking... No one's born a perfect salesperson. Yeah. Just time, the best. Time, time, time and repetition. Just developing that skill. 
Well, I believe in repetition. I think re- repetition is so important. I remember being at Hull City and it always stuck me this one. Mark Hurtley was our manager and he said, the great AC Milan team, he, he worked for, he played for Arrigo Saki and Arrigo Saki was here him. We used to drill them repetitively on throw-ins and corners and defending fucking goal kicks. And it was just repetition constant like that, right? But I believe in repetition and we do the same thing in training with us, with our team. Hence the reason we've had so much success with the leading company within the UK. But um, I think we're really scared of repetition. We're always looking for, for something new and we're always looking to do something a little bit quirky and different. Just watching the last dance of the Michael Michael Jordan documentary, have you seen it or not? I haven't, mate. Is it good, is it? I'll watch it later. Yeah. What a fucking reference for business, mate. It's unbelievable. But the, the late, great Kobe Bryant, God bless his soul, may he rest in peace. He played against Michael Jordan, who was a hero, and he was the heir to the throne. And he said, what he was really taken by, Chris, was how sound his fundamentals were. Mm. And that's the same with sales. If you get your basics right, okay, and you've got a really good mindset, and you take massive action, you'll win. But too many people are looking for all these new techniques and reading these fucking mad books and, and like just crazy shit. Mm. Selling to people and a numbers thing. That's it. It's about relationships and it's about numbers. Yeah. Trying to reinvent the wheel over and over again, but it's just the basics. Yeah. Yeah. So what's the future looking like for you? What are you manifesting at the present? Uh, what am I manifesting at the moment? Well, two weeks ago we were in Barcelona. I always manifested we'd be the number one firm in the UK. And our network prime is the biggest and best network in the UK. Wonderful people. And I relapsed in Barcelona, so I couldn't make the award ceremony where we were crowned number one in Barcelona in one of the most prestigious buildings I'd ever seen on pitches. I didn't make the event. I was in my hotel room, not in a good way of alcohol, sadly. So what I'm manifesting now is going to my meeting tonight. I've had another day clean and sober for me. God bless. But long term, I'm manifesting um, breaking every single record in this industry. I want to get, to, we've got 130 odd people now on us to get to 500 in three years, 5,000 in five years. Um, I'm manifesting documentary series, books, and maybe it's been a voice of, a voice for hope for people like me, addicts, people like me who suffer with mental illness, um, and be a voice for them and offer them some form of hope that like with, with treatment and, and therapy and with love and empathy, you can get better and things can work out and, there's a, there's a, I was, I was on, the other week I was on the, on a beach in Seaton Crew and um, I will tell you this story. The song Sunshine by Takes. I was reading the Gabriella Bernstein book. She's very big at the law of attraction manifestation and um, go through the 12 step program. It's fucking hard, mate. This might be the most hard, humbling experience I've ever been through in my full life. Really? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, it's, it's fucking tough. I'm having to go into places that I haven't been and I never wanted to go ever again and, and I'm having to live it out and for the first time in a long time been the best salesperson in the UK, but Brit had been the, the records that we broke the team, we've got the trophies, we've won what we've created. I'm, I'm now for the first time in a long time, the least informed person in the room. And it's a humbling experience. Just having to sit, li- listen and take my medicine and try and get better and, and work through things I never wanted to talk about again and, 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 and untangle the switchboard that's quite fucked up inside, you know? So, mm. um, but I was on the beach and I was having a really low moment. I wasn't suicidal, but I was having a really bad day. And the Gary L. Bernstein book, she says, look, Ask God, ask the universe for a sign that you're on the right path. She asked for an owl. She went to see a house that she was dreaming of with her husband and, and a car went past and had an owl in the sticker. And these signs from the universe are always there if you believe. And I I'm said, believing it too, yeah, I'm massive into it. Yeah, yeah. God bless. God bless. Well, listen, it's, it's, it's ignorant not to. So yeah. I, I said to him, I said, give me the word sunshine. Can I just show you some of my phones? All right. Yeah, of course. I said the word sunshine, right? And um, I said, please, just show me the word sunshine. I need, I need to know that. I need to know that I'm, I'm on the right track, please. Anyway, I'm uh, about an hour later. I'm sitting there, really fucking dark moment, and I got sent this by my kid, by my son, Kit's mum. Wow. <laughs> and you can't see because I've got it all flooded out there, right? But he's got a uh, basically. Fucking hell. I love shit like that. So I thought to myself, you know what? That's my fucking sign from God that this is the journey I'm supposed to be on. Mm. And this next journey, what I did was I created a mask to be the best in the industry. This mask was that was called the Wolf of fucking the, the Wolf of Winnie Banks, the Wolf. Um, I'm the record breaker, chest pounder. Come on, get up your seat. Tough exterior because as a child, mate, every single me- every single male mentor I looked up to was a muscle man. My dad did the doors and, and whatever else, and um, all my uncles were sort of big men, hard men, tough men coming off the estate. The only people you look up to 
mm. uh, hard men drug dealers. And I always thought being a leader was taking no shit, being a fucking no nonsense type of like, you know, alpha male. And actually, I don't think I am them things. I'm quite a vulnerable person and uh, and going through this reinvention of myself is quite challenging. So, um, yeah, it's um, I'm, I'm going through quite a period of change. But what I will say is, mate, this next period of my life, this rebirth of me is, is going to be one that's authentic. And if I if I'm not the best ever, which I, I know I, I think I am, I'm part of I'm a leader of the best team ever. At least I'll be myself, and I'll be honest and true with myself this time because living that lie and, and trying to be something else just hasn't made me happy at all. It's just fed the addiction. Mm. Have you read a book called The Metal Passage or not? No, but I'd like to. Yeah, um, I just went through a big change in my life. I sold my gym um, in December, and it was affecting my mental health hugely, but. Um, that made sense to it every like seven to eight years we go through a huge transition in our lives right. um so yeah i'd recommend reading that you might be able to relate to your current situation um you, i really appreciate that do you know what for reading's been a big part of me i will read that and i'll come back to it you're a good guy I, I appreciate that and i hope you're okay within yourself mm, yeah yeah i mean i've always identified myself as someone who couldn't read um, until this year and I've read five books this year and the key difference is to read something that you're intrigued about like <laughs> I read Harry Potter when I was a kid and I was flipping through the pages I was like I just wasn't soaking it in so I've always had the belief I couldn't read books but then I've transitioned to read something I enjoy self-development I've just fucking page after page yeah. oh, this is amazing this is amazing yeah, of course. yeah. yeah. can you relate yeah. to that yeah I can't totally can mate. I just can't so just my battery come up there it's going to die, so I was just... I can totally relate to it, man. Fair play, yeah? It takes a lot of humility and courage and guts to say, I'm not good to me, but I'm going to go and try again anyway. Mm. And, it's, and it, it, you know, we always revert to types of amount of times. I revert to, to reading audiobooks. My daughter yeah. only says, that's not reading, Dad. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I've reverted to that as well. And for a long time, you know, being off the estate, we, you get conditioned as a child, and me being a, a kid off the estate, I hated kids who went to university. I hated rich kids, mm. I hated kids that were given things. So in turn, I probably hated school. I probably mm. hated people who were quite well educated because I was conditioned that the rich took something from us. I was conditioned that the rich were all dodgy, they were all Tories and whatever else, which didn't mean fuck all of me. Yeah. So maybe that's why I rebelled against police, society, taking orders, authority, and reading was one of them things. But over the past two years, I've gone on a journey and I'll, I'll, do, I'll do at least one, one, two books a week now. Uh, depending on the size of the book, of course. The Alchemist is my favourite book ever. It's my go-to book. Have you read it right. before? Alchemist, I'll read that one down. Yeah. It's, it's my favourite book ever, yeah. I loved um, The Ride of a Lifetime by Bob Iger, the Disney CEO as well. One of my favourite books of all time. Wow. Um, I like Roy Keane's books. I just fucking love Roy Keane. <laughs> I <like the> class act. <laughs> I just love listening to Roy Keane because he tells the truth and he's authentic. Yeah. But um, yeah, you refer to type and, and, and one of our types, there's something really intrinsically powerful about reading and storytelling which is a massive part of sales as well right human beings can only learn from stories mm. we can yeah. only learn from stories or experience which is basically the same thing and a massive part of being a success in sales is becoming a good storyteller mm. facts and figures don't sell but stories do yeah i've heard that before um, so this podcast, the title is going to be referenced something to do with addiction. So if there's anybody with an addiction right now watching this, like what would your words of wisdom and advice be? Um, ask for help. Ask for help. Yeah. To me, I, I've lived this journey, this addiction thing now for 20 years. And I think being successful within business and, and, and being whatever I'm, I'm asking myself as the wolf and winning all these awards and whatever we've done with work and having success made me feel I was invincible and I could kid the world on. But really, I've not been kidding anyone, especially myself. So if you are struggling with addiction, speak to people. Um, I, I'm no expert, clearly. But I'm going to finish this, this call tonight, and I'm very grateful for you having me on, Chris. You're a good guy, and I wish you well, and I hope we can remain in contact. But I'm going to go to an NA meeting, to, and, and you know my week starts tonight when I go to an NA meeting, and I listen to people, because I don't have the self-belief in myself to get sober and clean. I do have self, self-belief in a lot of friends who I went to school with of our state who are now five, six, ten years sober. And I find inspiration in them. They're real heroic people to me. Amazing. Right, guys. Um, this has been Lee Flanagan's Resilient Journey in Life. Um, where can people 
hit you up if they want to get in touch, whether it's business, addiction, where can people get in touch with you? God bless you. Well, we've got a massive recruitment drive on at the minute, mate. Am I okay to drop a free plug? Anything you want, mate. <laughs> so listen, anybody can sell. We'll teach you how to sell. And you can work with us full-time, part-time, or in your own time. And selling is a very transferable skill. So, so we're recruited at the minute. We want to speak to good people. You've got Bespoke Financial Group. I'm on every platform from LinkedIn to Instagram, Facebook, all is Lee Flanagan. And we've recently gone on TikTok. I don't do any of them soppy videos dressed as a cucumber dancing and all that. Like, I'm a bit too old for that. But, you know, I'm on there and I put daily messages out there, sales tips, leadership tips, um, my journey, my experiences. And, yeah, you can, you can find me in any, any, any form of social media, mate. But very grateful for the opportunity. You're, you're a good guy and I wish you well. You're welcome. Right, guys, this has been the Resilient Businessman podcast episode number five. Thanks for coming on, Lee, and I'll see you in the next one.